Jesus Christ is the only one capable of eradicating the prejudice and racism that is on the rise in our divided world. And Christianity is the solution for the division that exists among us because by the grace of God, we are all joined together in the same spiritual body. We are family. I have brothers and sisters literally around the globe. But the beautiful thing about Jesus when he unites us in his spiritual family is that he does not eradicate our ethnicity. We bring the diversity of our culture and the full and dynamic expression of our upbringing and our cultures and our countries together as a cause for respecting each other and loving each other. I'm telling you the truth, that when a heart is possessed by the love of Jesus Christ, they see no distinction in all of humanity. Not only is Jesus Christ as the Lord capable of eradicating prejudice and racism around the world, he unites all of his people in the same mission. And that mission is to make disciples of all nations. So we've been spending the last seven or eight weeks talking about what it means to be a disciple. And we're taking it, of course, from Matthew chapter 28. Do you remember our chart? Matthew 28, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus rules over all. Jesus is Lord of all. Listen, friends, whether the government recognizes it or not, Jesus owns Canada. Jesus is his. He's Lord over all things, not just the church, but governments and peoples and all things. And he said... Because I'm Lord, do you make the connection? Jesus is Lord, and with his authority, he commissions the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and make disciples of all nations. We've defined discipleship by two simple words. It's reaching others with the gospel of Christ, it's having a burden for those who do not yet know the Lord, and then it's building those who come to know him up in their faith. It's teaching them to observe all things that he has commanded us. Now, if you'll remember, our second, the second stage to our journey in understanding what a disciple was, we gave you four words that define our target. And our target is, we need you to know who you are. You must understand your identity, that you have been redeemed by grace. You are now a new creation in Christ, and you belong to Jesus. And from your identity, your character is shaped. That is, you live the lifestyle of one who is devoted to following Jesus. You interrogate your lifestyle to make sure that it is consistent, that you are walking worthy of the Lord. From your character, you build your relationships. Relationships deteriorate because people's character is not intact or brought under the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ. We hate each other, we don't forgive each other, we get bitter at each other, we divide from each other, we backstab and gossip with each other because our character does not reflect our identity. Excuse me, our relationships do not reflect the character of one who belongs to Jesus. Once you know who you are and your lifestyle is reflecting it, you're building those wholesome relationships, you're supposed to go on mission with Jesus. He's gifted you so that you can serve him. And then do you recall we've given you five habits. Our mission is to make disciples. Our vision is to reach as a family, to reach the lost and build believers. And our priorities, there are five of them, and we've all used the word, the letter G, to define them. God time is time spent daily, alone in fellowship with God. Gather time is when we get together weekly to worship the Lord with his church. Grow time is the time that I spend consistently growing in community with a small group from my church. Uh, give time is time spent regularly using my gifts to serve others. The Lord placed 
a dynamic spiritual gift or ability in your life that he expects you to use in service for him. Now today we're going to finish on time spent, go time, time spent faithfully sharing my hope in Jesus. I want to talk to you about one of the core components of being a disciple, and that is that I am faithfully sharing the hope that I have in Jesus with others. You cannot call yourself nor consider yourself a disciple if you don't have time alone with God every day, if you are not regularly worshiping God with the church, if you are not uh, growing with others in spiritual community as you dig into the study of God's word, and you can't consider yourself a disciple unless you are engaging the spiritual gift that he has given in your life, and you cannot define yourself as a follower of Jesus if you are not using the opportunities that God gives you to tell others about the hope that you have through Christ. And I can't think of any passage in all of God's word that makes this as compelling and clear as 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Will you join me in your Bibles, please, to that passage of God's word, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I have to tell you that every time I open my Bible to this passage, I am transported back to nearly 40 years ago when I sat on a Sunday morning in a tiny country church about five rows back and the preacher was preaching on this text and my life changed forever. My destiny changed forever. My focus changed forever. So this is one of my favorite passages of God's word. It's Paul's compelling explanation about why he's passionate about sharing the gospel. I love the first part of the chapter, but we're going to skip over it. It's where Paul tells us about the heavenly home that God has prepared for us in the heavens. When we die, we're going home, he says. And uh, then now notice, I want to begin reading at verse number 9 and go all the way to the end of the chapter. And as always, I need to remind you that the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it, because this is the word of the living God the bread of life that you need to feed your soul today. My words are secondary. These words are primary. In verse 9, Paul says, So whether we are at home or away, dead or alive, <laughs> is what he's saying, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is also known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance, and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, and if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, I think this is Paul's point. He's saying, people of God, listen, do you know who you are now? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him, that is Christ, to be sin 
who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we share our hope in Christ because we are God's ambassadors. I can't think of a more thrilling position to hold in my life than for you and I to realize we are representatives of the living God and of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are the ambassadors of Christ. So this passage tells us, quite simply, how an ambassador behaves. And my first point is simply this, that ambassadors seek to please him in everything they do. An ambassador's heart is motivated with a desire to please the one they represent. In our case, we're seeking to please Christ. Did you notice the two references in this passage in verse 9 and 15? That uh, we are making it our aim, our goal, our target, is so that everything we do puts a smile on the face of God. It delights his heart. I think it's quite incredible that God describes himself in terms that we can relate to. That his children fill his heart with joy and delight. We make it our aim to please him. And then in verse number 15, he says, we stop living for ourselves. Wow, what a word for our selfish generation. Because we're consumed in today's world with what we want. But true freedom comes in dying to self and living for him. So the passion, the delight in our heart is to please God. But you know, don't you, that the only way we can please him is first knowing full well that he is as pleased with us as he is his son. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You cannot be motivated to please God until you know that he is pleased with you as much as he is with Jesus who upon his baptism spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And now because I am seated with Christ in heavenly places, he is my advocate, Christ is my advocate, my representative. The pleasure that God had in his son has been bestowed upon my life. I dare say that most of you don't live with that delightful notion swimming around in your heart every day. You rather fixate on what you have done wrong. You focus on your sin. You focus on your sense of insecurity and weakness. When God says, I've given you a gift, the greatest gift that your mind could ever conceive, and that is that I delight in you. You hear me, church family? God is pleased with you. He not only loves you, he delights in you. The Bible says he dances over you in Zephaniah chapter 3. He's written a song to celebrate you. But the struggle of our heart is to enter in to the privilege of it all. Lloyd John Ogilvy wrote, by the way, he was the famous chaplain of the U.S. Congress, famous Presbyterian pastor. In his book, The Autobiography of God, he said, he, that is the Lord, cannot be everything to you until you know and believe that you are everything to him. You are the pearl of great price to Jesus. So says Dr. Ogilvy, and the scriptures bear it out. Oh, how I pray that that mindset would shift in your life so that you'll get up every day and when those feelings of insecurity and fear and weakness start to creep back into your soul, you'll tell them to go to hell where they belong because God has installed in your heart the delight of his pleasure in you. I'm not preaching some other gospel. I'm preaching the gospel. The God who would be fully justified in saying to all of us, to hell with you forever, because we were rebels. We snub our noses in the face of God continually. We are thoroughly ruined by our sin, but God chose instead to place his delight upon us and his pleasure in us and his love for us. So 
ambassadors share the hope they have in Jesus because they know that it pleases God. This text is saying, you know what will bring pleasure to the heart of God? When you share Jesus, the hope of the world, the way, the truth, and the life with others. God breaks out in a smile when he listens in on the conversations where you're telling someone who is lost and without hope that Jesus Christ is the bridge for a man back to God. God takes pleasure in hearing his church activated in evangelism. Interesting, if you trace the word please through the New Testament, you'll discover some interesting things. Evangelism pleases God. Colossians chapter 1 says, when you walk worthy of the Lord, you're pleasing God. You say you're a Christian and your lifestyle reflects it. God looks at you and he smiles and his heart is filled with delight. He watches you in those tense moments as you respond with patience to those who are wounding you. He watches you in those difficult circumstances as you rise above it by the grace of God, and he smiles. I don't know all of you, and I wish I could know all of you. I know many of you, and I know when I look at you, my heart fills with joy. I think to myself, this church is blessed to have so many positive examples of what a true Christian is. If it pleases my heart, how much more the heart of God must sing in delight over his people. God's pleased when we share Christ, when we're faithful to walk worthy. Listen to this text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, Finally, brothers, we ask and urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so much more, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that each one of you should know how to possess his body in purity and sanctification and honor. So purity, keeping yourself unstained from the lifestyle of the world, pleases God. Paul said to Timothy, no man that wars in this spiritual warfare entangles himself or herself so that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Perseverance in spiritual warfare pleases God. And of course, you know, don't you, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says that faith pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So how do you know then that you are living to please your Lord, Jesus Christ? It's in the text in verse number 10. You live with the end in view. And what is the end? We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what we have done in our bodies Interesting, isn't it? This text says, good or evil, right or wrong. God's not going to reward wrong, obviously. He's going to rebuke it. But that's not his point in the text. His point in the text is, I'm pleased with you, so I want you to see the judgment seat as the culmination of your reward. The word appear here, by the way, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The word appear means to unveil, to show the true nature of what your life has really been all about. So I've been living for the glory of God 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. I awaken finally in the presence of the Lord, and there I stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And God says, it will be my great pleasure to say to you, well done good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I think it takes a split second for the Christian to know in their mind if they will anticipate those words when they meet the Lord. Because the Spirit who has warned us about the event to come will give us the wisdom to know if my lifestyle is pleasing to God or not. Here's what I would say. As I'm preaching, we're reading about the judgment seat of Christ, does the Holy Spirit bring an incident, a habit, part of your character, the purpose of your life into view? If he does, you know why he's doing that? Not to guilt you, but to say, deal with it so that at the end of the age when you stand in my presence, you won't have to say, I'm sorry, Lord. You'll be able to simply reach out and take those crowns 
that he will give to those who love his appearing. This isn't something just written in the New Testament. Isaiah put it this way, tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. So how do I know that my heart is to please God? Because I live with the end in view. At the end of this life, I'll awaken in the next, and I'll stand before that great throne of Christ, and he will review my life in order to reward the faithfulness that I have attempted to give. You don't have to be perfect, because no one is perfect, but you better be dealing with your day-to-day -day life. You track it with me, church family? You look so serious today. Good. Good. You should be serious about this. The world needs to hear about Jesus. And ambassadors share Jesus because they want to please him in everything they do. Number two, ambassadors present him to every man. That's in verse 11. Notice what he says. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. So lots of people stumble over that term, the fear of the Lord. Should Christians live in the fear of God? Yes! <laughs> How's that for being clear? Of course we should. It is not a condition that the, only the Old Testament saints experience when they stood at the base of Mount Sinai and the whole thing shook with rumbling and there was fire and smoke. We who are God's people today should live in the fear of God. You better understand what the fear of God means. I think the fear of God has two sides to it. The first side is to live with a continual consciousness of his great power and glory. To be so captivated with the majesty of God that your heart stands in awe, in reverent awe of who he is. I'm a little embarrassed when I think about my days in Sunday school as a child where we were manipulated to sit still and shut our mouths because they thought they were teaching us the fear of God. That's what they told us. They, didn't, they really weren't teaching us the fear of God. They were trying to keep us in control because they didn't want to deal with a noisy little boy. That's not necessarily the fear of God. It does mean that we treat sacred things with the high respect they deserve. But laughter may be as an, much an expression as the fear of God, as quietness is. It means to live continually in the awareness that he is the great God Almighty of the universe. I think about the fear of God when I, I compare it to my marriage. I love my wife to such an indescribable degree that I don't want to do anything that will embarrass or wound or shame her. In the same way, the children of God look at who he is and say, I don't want to be guilty of doing anything that will bring disrepute upon who you are. By the way, Acts 9.31 says the church enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened living in the fear of God. And they were encouraged by the Holy Spirit and so they increased in numbers. So the fear of God is a continual consciousness of his power and glory. And track with me, church family. Say we're tracking, Derek. It is a constant awareness of his wrath on all men without Jesus. It is living in the knowledge that there is such a horrible place called hell. And men who reject Christ, mankind who rejects Christ, will ultimately end there for an eternity of separation and punishment. And so the fear of God is knowing that there is an ultimate destination of destruction called hell. Jesus taught, allegedly Jesus taught more about hell than he did heaven. Why? Because he was more concerned about hell. He doesn't want anyone to go there. He wants people to be warned of the ultimate destiny of men who say no to God's amazing gift. 
Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, I'll tell you who to fear. Check it out, Luke 12, verse 5. I'll tell you who to fear. He, by the way, his warning was, you don't need to fear man who can only kill you once. I'll tell you who to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed you, sends you to hell. The fear of God is living in the conscious awareness of the wrath of God upon men's deserved sinful rebellion toward him. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11, John says, I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and whose ever name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire which burns forever. This is the second death. You understand, don't you, that I have no pleasure, nor does God have pleasure in the death of a soul or the death of the wicked. But he warned us about it and says it ought to be a motivation for you. Do you see the connection in the text? Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Are you a persuader? Are you someone who uses your words to convince others that the truth is found in Jesus? That's what the word persuade means. We're supposed to persuade others. We have a culture that says, keep your mouth shut and don't tell me what you believe. God says, open your mouth and persuade men that they need Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. We're supposed to be persuading men. How do we persuade men? We persuade them by proclamation, by education, and by verification. We argue the validity and the veracity and the logic and the, the, indif the, the defensible reasoning of Jesus as the God-man who died in our place. We show the thousands of years of history leading up to Christ and then their familiar fulfillment in Christ. So Paul was a persuader. Listen to what Paul did in Acts chapter 18. We're told he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and he tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. Then he went on to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 and we're told that he entered the synagogues and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading about the wrath of God about the gospel of Christ. So reasoning and persuading. You know, don't you, Peter said, all of you be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that lies within you. There's only one of two reasons that we don't persuade others, because we're ashamed of Jesus. We really don't want to open our mouths and say, I'm a follower of Christ, I belong to him, and we don't want to do it in family gatherings and company dinners though the world brags about all of its philosophies and worldviews, we end up being ashamed of the one who died in our place at the cross. Or the second reason is we haven't taken the time simply to learn the gospel in our own terms so that we can explain it. But who can't explain that Jesus loves the world? The world is separated from God because of their sin. But he died as the substitute for our sin and whoever receives him is become a child of God. Who can't explain that to others? It's so simple that I rather think the real reason is we are embarrassed, ashamed of him. And of course, he said, didn't he? Whoever is ashamed of me before men. That's pretty serious stuff. You refuse to raise my name in conversation with others? I will not declare your name before the Father in heaven. That's pretty sober reality. Listen, and I'm a representative of Jesus. You're his witness. We're all witnesses. We're ambassadors for Christ. The heart of an ambassador is, I want to please my Lord, and I want to persuade others every chance I can. Let me just show you thirdly and lastly, an ambassador Present, will presence him everywhere that he goes. Ambassadors presence him everywhere they go. Now, for those of you who are grammarians and you know English grammar, you know that the word presence is a noun. But that's my very point. 
The word presence, which is a noun, is transformed in this text to a verb because this passage is actually telling us that everywhere the ambassador goes, the living God is in them, radiating through them. Just as God was in Christ, Christ is now living in me, and he, listen to me, he is making the appeal through us. You know what that means? I don't have to convince anybody to trust Jesus. I just have to tell them, and Christ will appeal to them. So this passage is saying wherever the ambassador goes, he himself is there in his mystical presence, hence violating the laws of grammar. We presence him wherever we go. When you speak up, there's a still small voice that echoes behind your expression, and it is the still small voice of Jesus. Wherever you extend a hand of friendship to somebody who's hurting or somebody who is in need, listen to me, this text is telling you that when you extend your hand, you are actually extending the hand of Jesus. Isn't that cool? Jesus resides in the community of the church and in the life of the believer. So where I go, he goes. Now that's pretty cool. Because some of you work in some dark environments. You have some bosses that may be Satan incarnate. <laughs> you have some neighbors who are hard to get along with. You are facing some life heart-crushing trials, but where you go, Jesus goes. You bring the light wherever you go. So I want to say it again, ambassadors presence him everywhere they go. That's in verses 14 through 21. It is Jesus radiating himself through the new man that he said was created in Christ in verse number 17. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. What is the new creation? The new creation is Jesus himself is radiating through we who have trusted him as Savior and Lord. Now, there are three sides to this spiritual reality. The first is, he says, how, how then do I cooperate with this Jesus who wants to radiate through my life? The first thing he says in verse number 14 is, the love of Christ must control you. There's no room for hatred. There's no room for grudge. There's no room for in inflammatory talk about other people. Now, this is not saying the love, of, he, the love of Christ in us, controlling us, is not talking about man's love hyped up. He's talking about a divine deposit that happens in the soul of man by the miracle of the Holy Spirit. Romans 5 says, the love of, you can no more determine to love others as God loves them with your own power than you can sprout wings and fly. Romans 5 says, the, the Spirit pours the love of God into my heart. If you know you're a selfish Christian and you're given to being a hateful believer, then ask God to rid you of the hate and to fill it. You need to pray, Holy Spirit, are you listening to me, church family? You need to pray, Holy Spirit, fill my empty, cold, stubborn heart and selfish heart with the love of Almighty God. You cannot make it happen any more than, again, I can sprout wings and fly. God delights to fill your heart with the love of Christ. It is the very love of Jesus. The very love of Jesus. What love is that? indescribable, unspeakable love. That was love of the man, the, the God-man who walked up Golgotha's mountain and who had the power with a blink of his eye to obliterate the Roman soldiers who were about to nail his body to a tree. Instead, he prayed, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. That's the love of God. That's the love of God. So how do I presence Jesus? I must become a receptor, a receptacle, a vessel that is empty of self and filled with the love of God. 
Then he talks, the second thing that he says is, the death of Christ must transform you. He, notice in verse 14, he talks first about the love of Christ must control us, and then he launches into a remembrance that he who died, died for us so that we might live for him. What is he saying? He pours his love into our hearts, and the work of the cross is the power by which I die to the old life and I'm now alive to God. So the old sinful man in me has been crucified in Christ. The Bible actually teaches that by identification through faith, what happened to Jesus there has happened to me. I'm dead to sin, but I'm now alive unto God. So much so that Paul says it transforms the way you see the world. We don't see anybody anymore according to the flesh. We don't battle in flesh with flesh and blood. We look at the eternal value of their soul and a person for whom Christ died and someone that God is longing to see a part of his family and he's waiting for me to tell them that the door is wide open and Christ awaits for them to turn in repentance and faith. How can I, as an ambassador of Christ, how can I presence him everywhere? My heart must be controlled by his love. I must be entering into the death of Christ by faith. And then the ministry of Christ must motivate me. So God, the, the ministry of Christ is a ministry of reconciliation. Oh, you've been so good and I wanna keep going. I'll try, the landing gear is down. That means we're gonna, we're gonna stop soon. But. I'll give you a minute to get your seat tray back in its place and <laughs> listen to me, listen to me carefully. The ministry of Jesus Christ is described by Paul in this text. The purpose for his coming, the reason for his being here, his heart now is to reconcile men to God. Reconciliation is bridging the gap between the enemies of God while we were yet sinners, while we were still enemies. Christ died for us. And God, through Christ, has reconciled us to himself. So the ministry of the gospel is a ministry of reconciliation. Just a quick word. Don't bother trying to tell your friends about Jesus. If you have family members you won't forgive, who have hurt you. I know that's an oversimplification, but Jesus said, forgive others as you have been forgiven. By the way, in January, I'm gonna teach four weeks on what forgiveness is about and some of the complicated matters that affect forgiveness. But for now, I'm telling you that to say you know Jesus and you're a follower of Christ is to be a peacemaker. It's to seek to bring factions together through Christ. How exciting. Then he ends this chapter with what is my favorite verse in all the Bible. For he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know what that verse is saying? Jesus took your place so that you could take his. He took your place on the cross so that you could take his place in fellowship with the Father so that God could deposit his very righteousness in you. Jesus took my sin, he became sin, the Bible says, so that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm one who wandered far from God. I went down some ugly, sinful paths. I doubt if there's a law of God that I didn't break. I had accrued every debt of unrighteousness that a 17-year-old could accrue. And in the moment I bowed my knee to Jesus, he emptied my debt and deposited his righteousness. He took my place so I could take his at the Father's right hand. Because you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now watch this. He took my place so that I could take his in fellowship with God and his in reconciling the world to God. 
because Christ has sent his church for the purpose of reconciling the world back to himself. You know why? Because he says, I don't want to count your trespasses against you. They can be deleted, forgiven, forgotten forever. Can you imagine that? All the evil I've ever done is gone forever. And all God sees is his righteousness now. So are you reconciled to God? Have you said to this Jesus, now that's a deal of eternity. I'm taking it. I want you as my savior. I want you as my forgiver. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I invite you, Jesus, to come into my heart. Stretch out your hand, if not physically stretch it out in faith and say, I'm putting my hand in yours, Jesus. I want this eternal deal. I want my sin to be struck out and your perfection applied to my heart. The second part is easy. How much of an ambassador are you? Do people look at you and say, no, there's something different about that woman. That man stands out among all of his coworkers. He doesn't cuss, chew, and steal. Oh, he's just an average guy, just like everybody else, but there's, there's a distinction about it. There's something distinct about his life. I need to know what it is. That's an ambassador. Let's pray together. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm not going to single you out or embarrass you, but if you prayed that prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, I want to pray for you at the end of the service. Would you just slip your hand up? I want to pray for you. I'll wait just a moment. Anyone? God bless you in the back. Thank you. You may put your hand down. God bless you, sir. I'll wait just a minute. Now for the rest of us, let's get busy being an ambassador. Let's represent him to the high heaven. Let's please him in everything we do, present him to every man, and presence him wherever we go. Thank you for your amazing grace in our lives. Thank you for the good story and the great news of the gospel, that you took my place so that I could stand in yours, in perfect fellowship with your heavenly Father, our Father now, God our heavenly Father. I pray for this one gentleman especially that you would seal that sacred decision in his heart and that he would quickly get himself planted in this local church and begin to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us energy and momentum to build disciples as you've commanded us to do and to make ambassadors out of your people in all that we do. May your blessing be upon your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.